Welcome to the North Shore Fellowship online service. We are so glad that you are here. If you're watching on Facebook, please take a moment to like and share this video. Or if you're watching on YouTube, take a second and share this link with a friend so that others can hear about the work that God is doing here at North Shore Fellowship through our online service. Before we jump into worship, let's take a moment and pause and pray and invite God into our time together. Father, we thank you that you've given us the opportunity to gather and worship you in this format, and we pray that your blessing would be upon us. Help us push out all other distractions and anything that would get in the way of us meeting with you. And as we draw near to you, we pray that you would fulfill the promise you make in James, that you would draw near to us. Guide us this day. We pray all this in the great name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's worship together.
Friends, welcome back to our series, Without Excuse. And this is a study of the book of Romans. Romans is a letter that Paul wrote to the Roman church, a church that was in Rome that he had never visited. He had wanted to, he's told us how eager he was to get there, but he had never been there until the very end of Acts. But here, as he's writing from Corinth, he's writing to them and he's addressing certain things. He's also given them good foundational blocks for doctrine and the belief and he talks about the gospel in fact Romans 1 when we first opened the series we looked at Romans 1 16 for I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes that's a recurring theme and then in 18 verse chapter 1 18 he says the wrath of God is being revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness and then also he says in verse 20 these things and this is where we get our title uh, for since the creation of the world God's invisible qualities his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood by what has been made so people are without excuse and that's the name of our title so that name of our series and Paul delves into those themes and more in the first few chapters now by the time we get where we are now in Romans chapter 3 um, he had already talked about the wrath of God and he he put forth the difference between Jews who have the law they had the Word of God and Gentiles who didn't but he emphasizes that they both are in the same dire need of salvation that only comes through Jesus the Messiah so let's jump into Romans 3 um, we're gonna start with verse 9 because we did the first part of it last week so Romans 3 verse 9 well then should we conclude that we Jews are better than others? No, not at all. For we have already shown that all people, whether Jews or Gentiles, are under the power of sin. As the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good, not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. They have no fear of God at all. <laughs> These sound like awful people, but you know what? In many ways, it's you and I. But then in verse 19, obviously the law applies to those whom it was given for its purposes to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire the entire world is guilty before god for no one can ever be made right with god by doing what the law commands the law simply shows us how sinful we are all right well paul put it plainly there that no one can be made right with god by doing what the law commands the law shows us how sinful we are so Paul tells us the purpose of the law and bear in mind that they're speaking of the commandments the Torah at this point the New Testament had not been written so the commandments that were required of believers in the one true God is the law and that it's basically telling us here Paul says we can't keep it we need another way to be made righteous in the New King James Version actually the King James Version of that last verse we read Romans 9 20 it says therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin so basically what he's saying is that we are not able to keep the law and it kind of leaves us in this state of dependency for salvation it leaves us in a place where we are at our wits end we are helpless we are completely dependent on something other than keeping the law to find salvation and that's where the good news comes uh, later in this chapter but I want to say this is that um, there was a book that was written by a guy named AJ Jacobs about 15 years ago and he was a agnostic Jew also a journalist in New York City he described himself as a human guinea pig and he did several things where he just tried something he, that perhaps couldn't be done and one of them is when he is what he chronicled in the book the 2008 book called the year of living biblically one man's humble quest to follow the bible as literally as possible so in it he describes what he did he made an effort he experienced the entire year of attempting as best he could to be as torah observant as he possibly can and i mean beyond what we're even seeing in the orthodox jewish community he spent an entire year attempting to live by every law that was put forth in 
the Bible. In, in, he's a Jew, so in the Old Testament. He grew his beard, he wore the single robe, he ate kosher, but those were the small things. He tried to even do the big things and even the seemingly insignificant things that are put forth in the over 600 commandments in the law. And he desperately tried struggling to comply with all that the law requires. <laughs> you know, even the ancient rituals. And he, he came to this conclusion that it's impossible. It's impossible in the modern age to even attempt to try to apply the law to every part of your life as it's prescribed. Unsurprisingly, he failed miserably. And, you know, there was just simply things he just could not do. Things like temple sacrifice, things like, you know, temple worship and, and other things that he just simply could not do. So he concluded that uh, it's, it can't be done. He came away with a great respect, however, he says, for Bible literalists, in other words, evangelical Christians, However, he said there's no way anybody can do it. You can't keep the biblical law. Well, the early church came up with, the, with that same conclusion. <laughs> and, you know, there was a time in the early church, remember it was all Jewish, and then an abundance of Gentiles were coming in to make one new humanity that was always intended to be by God. So there's new people coming, new people coming that are not even Jewish, so they have no idea what the law is. So the Jews, as they were, the leaders of the church, had to decide, what do we do? Do we introduce them to the law and then make them keep it? Or just simply instruct them that, you know, it's the grace of the Lord Jesus that saves them and they don't have to try to keep the law. And so they addressed this issue in something called what we call the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And let me just read a few verses from this, because Peter shines brightly coming up with the, the, you know, the, the conclusion of what they settled the matter with. Verse 6 says, The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did for us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Verse 10, now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it's through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. In other words, Peter is admitting that the yoke of the law was something that they or even their ancestors were unable to bear, unable to, to, uh, to keep. And so it was determined that it's only through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we're saved, not by keeping the law, not by what we have now, Christian sacraments, not by good works, not by, even by holy behavior. It's simply by receiving the free gift that's grace, that's what grace means, free gift, of Jesus, his sacrifice on the cross by faith. And this is the origin of faith, justification by faith, that we get into a little bit later and throughout the book of Romans. So verse 21 says this, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. <laughs> That's a very inclusive statement with one criteria, that you believe, faith, belief. That's the essential ingredient. So remember Romans 1 when we read it, it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to who? Everyone who believes, first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. This was the order that it rolled out, first to the Jew, but then as was prophesied to the Gentile. This is the essence of the gospel, the good news. When you hear the word gospel, you think good news. Good news is something that should make you smile. <laughs> and that's what the gospel is, the good news. But it's hard for people to understand the good news until they really understand the bad news. The good news is a remedy for the bad news. And what is the bad news? Well, there's several good news, bad news, actually bad news, good news verses that are coming up. In fact, the next two are that. And they're the first part of what we call Romans Road. Listen to what it says in verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the bad news. Verse 24. 
And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. That is the good news. See, these verses, as I said, are the first step of what we call Romans Road, a collection of verses through Romans that clearly portray the gospel, the need for the gospel, the cure for the gospel, if you will. And this is what it is. And it's like the next verse is, uh, and the Romans wrote is Romans 6.23. So you had Romans 3.23, then 6.23. It basically says, says the same thing, but in one verse. It says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The bad news is, is everyone sinned. And even worse news is everyone who sinned is deserving of eternal death. But the good news of the gospel is that the free gift of God is eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is what we share. That is the good news, that Jesus gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin so that we can receive this by grace when we believe. And when I say believe, that means put your entire faith and trust in, not just admit his existence, but believe, put your faith and trust in him. So through his sacrifice, we believe. Next verse in our text, verse 25. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in the past. He was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in the present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Makes sinners right, or makes them righteous, or justifies them. You know, this is called being justified by faith, JBF. Justified by faith, not by works, not by anything you can do, just by the faith factor of what you believe and putting your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Justified is a cool word because it's, it's really redeeming. It's really kind of liberating. I, I heard it described as justified can be described as just as if I'd never sinned. <laughs> it kind of sounds the same. See, when we believe and put our faith in Jesus and his righteousness, it, his righteousness is imputed to us. It, it, it is put upon us so that our sins are not held against us. And we're free from God's wrath, which is upon everyone who does not believe. And what's more, not just being freed from God's wrath, we're given the gift of God, which is eternal life in Jesus Christ. That is extremely good news when you understand what the bad news is. But the fact that we're justified, that we're made right, or we're made righteous by him, not by us, not by anything we did, but by him. Um, I was talking to my daughter recently, and we were trying to come up with an analogy, and this is a loose analogy. Uh, first time out. But, you know, can you imagine that you're trying to get into a top college and you go take the SAT test, right? And you are taking the SAT and you realize you're failing miserably. You're getting more than half of the questions wrong and you're just completely distraught because you know you're not going to be accepted. And then when it comes to calculating the results, instead of taking your test, they take Jesus' test. And that test is credited to your score. And it's a perfect 1600 or above. I don't think it gets higher. <laughs> that is what's going on. His righteousness is, is imputed in us as if we did it, even though we didn't. The very next verse in our text, verse 27. Can we boast then <laughs> that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law. It's based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. After all, is God the God of the Jews only? Isn't he also the God of the Gentiles? Of course he is. There's only one God and he makes people right with himself only by faith, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. Well then, if we emphasize faith, does this mean we can forget about the law? Of course not. In fact, only when we have faith do we fully fulfill the law. Interesting. When we have faith, the law makes sense. The law, we actually walk in the law. And I'll explain that in a second. So, so, so far in Romans, what we've seen is the wrath of God, the judgment of God, and the wages of sin. 
But we see here that we're freely justified, freed from all that, and made righteous by our faith in the sacrifice of Jesus. That means everything to us. And that's the good news of the gospel. That's why Romans 8, 1 says there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Even though we deserve it, we deserve condemnation just like the rest of the world, we don't get condemnation because we're in Christ Jesus. That is the beauty of the gospel. That is the good news. Something you want to share. Something you want to share. But I have a question. There's no condemnation for sin, right? We sin, but we're not condemned. But is there consequence? There's no condemnation, but is there also no consequence? And the answer to that is this. It's very important to understand that while we are forgiven of our sin, that means we're saved, saved from eternal death, saved from the wrath of God, we still reap the consequences of our sin. You know, a criminal gets saved in prison. Maybe he did, did awful things, and he's serving time, and he gets saved, gives his life to Jesus. Jesus re- forgives him, makes him a new creation. But he can't walk out of that prison. He has to serve his time. He's bearing the consequences for his sin. No longer condemned by God, but he has to bear the consequences. Galatians 6, 7 says this, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. See, our flesh... It's not so much our skin. Sometimes in the Bible it is talking about the flesh fell from their bones. Not this time, and particularly in the New Testament. The flesh is our sin nature. It's our sin nature. It's the part of our mind and emotions, our soul, that always wants to try to please the ungodly impulses of our body and our mind. And it's the root of lust and pride. So when we sin, we are, as Paul says, sowing seeds, planting seeds that will someday grow and become destructive. When we sow to the flesh, when we give into the flesh, we're, we're planting seeds or we're starting a chain reaction that will someday boomerang back and be destructive. Something will be destroyed. Something will be damaged. Something in our lives will be affected by the result of that sin. God's not mocked. You reap what you sow. 1 John 2.16 tells us that there's really three sins in the world, three things in the world, and they are the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Actually, the order in 1 John 2, 16 is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things. And when we indulge in these three things, there will always be consequences. Some will be colossal, some might be minimal, but there will always be something that experiences destruction as a result of us sowing into the flesh by these sins. Well, in the case of lust of the flesh, think about it. Whatever that means to you, it may result in health problems or addictions and behaviors, sometimes very serious illnesses, sometimes even death, simply by indulging in the lust of the flesh. How about the lust of the eyes? You may think that's harmless. No. Whatever that means to you, lust of the eyes, it may manifest itself in envy and and discontentment and jealousy and anger and depression, and that is destructive to our minds and emotions. And what about pride? Pride. It can easily be insidious or secret pride, but it will result in selfishness and perhaps even bitterness and eventually have a devastating effect on our relationships with other people and with God. Let me remind you that pride was the sin of Satan. The sin of Lucifer was pride. So what does it mean to sow in the flesh? It means to give in to, to, to appease and acquiesce to the indulge uh, the, the impulses and dece- and the deception and also the desires of the flesh when we are tempted but the good news is that we can also as we just read in galatians 6 7 we can also sow into the spirit and that produces good things so never keep that out of your mind always remember that you know when we sow into the spirit that means things like worship and you know uh, teaching and and praying and, and spending time and obeying and reading and obeying God's word. We're sowing into the spirit. Romans 8, 6 says this, one of my favorite scriptures. It says, the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. 
And we can actually indulge in life and peace by having our mind not controlled by the flesh and our sinful nature, but controlled by the spirit and moving into the spiritual, into our spirit man, into life and peace and godliness and wisdom and power and all the things that the spirit offers. Love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, you know the rest. And I would say this, the life and, and peace that we experience in the spirit is way more satisfying and fulfilling than whatever we experience in the flesh. I truly believe that. But what about when we struggle? We all struggle. What about when we struggle and our flesh gets the upper hand and we can't seem to keep from saying things and thinking things and doing things that we know are wrong, but if we feel trapped, like it's got us and we just do the things that Paul says in Romans 7, the thing I don't want to do, I do. What about that? Are we condemned for those things? And will we experience God's wrath because of those things? No. No. Not if what we just read is true about justification by faith. We're justified through the grace of Jesus. However, we will, yes, we will experience consequences of all that, which is why God is so concerned. God is so concerned that he tries to get us out of it. He tries to help us out. He offers us discipline. He offers us discipline. Hebrews 12, 6, the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. What does discipline look like? Well, there might be just some level of trouble in your life or struggles or even obstacles keeping you from going down your path. And often they're intended to make us stop and think and pray before we continue down that destructive path that we've been going down. And sometimes it comes as a rebuke from the Lord, even a sharp word of correction from the Holy Spirit. Why? Why? Because he loves us. And he he loves us. He desires what's best for us. He wants very much for us to avoid sin and walk away from destructive behaviors because he knows of the destruction it brings to us and is keeping us from life and peace in the spirit that he desperately wants us to have. So that's why Revelation 3.19 says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent, Jesus says. Repent? What does that mean? Stop doing bad things? That's the result of repentance. Repentance means, as I say many times, metanoia, change of mind, change your mind. That's something we can all do. All it requires is changing your mind from one thing to the other. That's what repentance means. This is the way, you know, we repent. You, you think one way about something and then you say, uh-uh, 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 I'm going to completely change my perspective and think the other way. That's how you became a believer. One minute you were not a believer. Then you repented change your mind around, and then before you know it, you're saying, I believe. And that has made every difference in the world and eternity if that's true of you. The devil wants to tell you, oh no, you can't do it. You're powerless. It's no use. You're already set in your ways. There's no turning around, no turning back. That's a lie. You have the ability to take every thought captive, to change your mind, especially through the power of the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says this, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Because when you do, then you'll walk in the Spirit. Then you'll experience the life and peace instead of the death and destruction that the, that the enemy intends for you. Ask God to help you. He, listen, he knows your weakness. He wants to help you. He understands what you go through because Jesus himself went through all these things and he did it successfully. So he, he's a good authority expert in helping you to get through. He's a very present help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 15 and 16 says this, and we're going to close with this scripture. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Pray. Pray that God will give you the power and understanding to allow his spirit to govern your mind and lead you into a life of eternal peace. May God bless you 
as you walk in his peace. Thank you, Pastor. Good morning. Warmest welcome to you all. Great to be with you again. Is it truly possible that we're at the end of October already? <laughs> it certainly is. Well, why don't we see what we have going on? First up, a very special invitation to you for a uh, night of prayer for Israel. Now, that's going to be today, Sunday, October the 29th at 6 p.m. at the Leonardo Baptist Church. We're co-sponsoring this event with a local Messianic congregation, Ari Yudah. It's entitled Worship and Prayer for Israel. Join us for a special night of worship and prayer as we come together as God's people to intercede for Israel and for America. I can't think of anything more timely or necessary than this right now. I hope you'll be able to join us. That's this evening at 6. Let's talk about a few events that are coming up just this week. How about this Thursday, uh, Marriage Ministry. Again, they meet the first Thursday of each month, so that puts it on November the 2nd. All married couples are welcome. If you have any questions, like to get the details, we have Stephanie DiPietro's email address. You can contact her, and she can get you all the details. For the ladies, this coming Saturday, November the 4th, the Women's Monthly Breakfast starts at 9 a.m. It's held at the Women's Club of Red Bank, which is a really nice venue. Uh, it is completely free, but they do ask for an RSVP. We do have a QR code or a URL. Love to just give them the heads up that you're coming so everything can be set up. It's a wonderful time of worship and fellowship, and like I said, it's completely free. So ladies, I hope you'll be able to come out and join them this coming Saturday. And this coming Sunday, November the 5th, we are uh, combining with Samaritan's Purse and we will be collecting the boxes for Operation Christmas Child. Uh, so <laughs> you thought you had time to do your Christmas shopping? Not there. This will be coming up fast. So this is where we're going to be collecting the shoe boxes or the colorful boxes that we have with all the toys and things that will be going out to the kids in need throughout the world. There's a little tag on there that says whether you bought for a boy or a girl and what age range. And we do collect a $10 fee for getting the shipping that's going out from there. You can also go to Samaritan's Purse website. They do have all the details over there, but we are collecting them next Sunday because they do have to be shipped out to all the different areas there too. Hey, finally, next weekend, I want to remind you that it's National Make It to Church on Time Sunday. That's right, the clocks fall back next weekend. So just a little, a little tip for you there. Hey, we have far more than this going on. There's a bunch of events coming up and as we head into December. Easiest way to keep up with all of them, get your, your name on our email list. Send us your contact information to info at northshorenj.org. Everything comes to your inbox. Couldn't be simpler than that. Regular events that we have during the week, Sunday online services 9 and 1030 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube Premiere, and our Sunday in-person service, of course, 10 a.m. at the Middletown South High School. We're in the Southside Theater. You come in on the side by the football field, by the big American flag. Just look for Southside Theater. It's right there. Very easy to find us there. New space is coming together quickly, but not quite yet, so we're still over at the high school for right now. Well, uh, would you allow me to say thank you? Thank you to all of you who've just been so great in your financial support for everything that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. I invite you to come and participate with us financially. You can go to our website and pull down on the menu. We have a QR code. We even have a donation by text system. Just make sure that you're using the newer number. Couldn't be easier to have your financial donation come in. And again, would encourage you all to just take a portion of what God has provided and putting it back toward getting his word out in this area. Would you join me as we pray over the offering that we're going to collect this morning? Lord, we come before you, humbled and grateful for all that you give and all that you provide. Father, we ask that you would take this offering now, that you would purpose it, that you would direct it, that you would multiply it, that you would use it as you see fit. Father, make us wise for the work that you have for us. Direct us in everything that we do. Be pleased in all that you find here. Father, we thank you and praise you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So, as you can hear, there's a bunch of things going on, bigger events, smaller events, and there's a lot more coming as we head into uh, December. I hope that you'll be able to come out and join us in person. Remember, you are always welcome, and we would love to have you join us. So come on out and see us. Have a terrific week, and may God bless you all. Staring in your sons in
Friend, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching to the end. My prayer is that something reached your heart today, something of the word, maybe even the worship. Maybe there's something in the announcements that picked your curiosity and you want to respond to it. Please do. My earnest prayer is that you have received Jesus as your Savior. You heard from my sermon that it means everything, not just for today, but for eternity. If you've never made that commitment, if you've never made that decision, reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you about it and lead you into a prayer of salvation and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that will change your eternity. God bless you.